So today I'm very excited to, uh, uh, to um, introduce Professor Ken Miller. Uh, Professor Miller is the Rose Associate Professor of State and Local Government, and as of July 1, will be the Director of the Rose Institute of State and Local Government. Today we're talking about Texas versus California, an in-depth look at the leaders of red and blue America. Professor Miller, thank you so much for being with us today. I turn the program over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Evan, and thanks um, all of you for uh, joining in this conversation today. I want to thank uh, again, Evan and the folks at the CMC Office of Alumni and Parent Engagement for inviting me to give this talk about um, my relatively new book. It came out last year, uh, Texas versus California. Here's a copy of the book. Um, and what I thought I'd do today is share a little bit about uh, why and how I wrote the book and some of its major themes and a little bit about what I learned through this process. Um, I'm uh, really more interested in getting uh, questions from you to see what you're interested in. So I'll really try to keep this to no more than half hour in my own um, remarks and then we'll uh, have chance for discussion. So um, first of all, why, <clears throat> why I wrote this book and, and how it came about. So um, a little bit of background about me that I, I'm a native Californian, um, actually fifth generation Californian, which is a little bit unusual and have always been interested in the history and politics of this state. Um, at one point pretty early on in my career, I actually worked in the California legislature uh, for a state senator as a Senate fellow. And through that experience really got um, super in, engaged and interested in California politics. Um, I actually went back then and got a PhD in political science and my academic focus became uh, state and local politics and in particular, California politics. And I joined the CMC faculty in 2003, which as many of you may remember was the year of the first governor's recall election. Um, that was a big year uh, for people who study California politics. Um, I remember Jack Pitney was constantly getting uh, uh, media calls from around the world, people interested in that recall election. And at that point, I decided, you know, this is a topic that's of real interest um, uh, to our students at CMC and otherwise. So I created a class um, that first year that I was at CMC in California politics and have been teaching it ever since. So for a couple of decades, I've been really focusing my academic work, both teaching and writing on California politics. And during the course of those two decades, uh, California has changed in the same way that the nation has changed, which is to say it's become more um, polarized. Uh, the nation has become more polarized and California for its part has become um, more uh, overwhelmingly democratic. When I started teaching California politics, the state was still uh, really a competitive two-party state and um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, a Republican, won the recall election in, in that year. Um, and over the course of the past two decades, the state has really uh, gravitated much more strongly to the, the Democratic Party. So there's now uniform Democratic control of all offices of state uh, government and both houses of the legislature. And that was part of a, a larger sorting with, uh, throughout the country. So a lot of states became either more solidly Republican or Democrat. And so in my uh, work on this, on this topic of, of studying and writing about California, I, I decided it'd be really interesting to try to situate what was happening in California in the national context. A lot of political scientists are interested in this topic of polarization. And I thought a great way to um, take a new look at this topic was to look at the state level, to look at how states have sifted or sorted uh, into one camp or the other increasingly and how states increasingly are trying to influence the direction of federal policy from the state level. So um, coalitions or blocks of red states um, all challenged the Obama administration on matters of federal policy, um, most often led by Texas and its attorney general during the Obama administration. And when Donald Trump became president, California became the leader of the blue state resistance uh, against the Trump administration and filed more than 100 lawsuits against the Trump administration in only 
four years. So this is, uh, it became increasingly clear that these two states, California and Texas, were becoming the leaders nationally of these uh, two blocks, the progressive block for California and the conservative block for Texas. And so it became sort of this natural, uh, interesting story of this rivalry between uh, these two states. What was sort of surprising to me was that there had not yet been a book um, com comparing these two states and how they polarized in the way that they had. A lot of uh, books had been written, a lot, well, there have been things written, for example, in The Economist magazine, there was a special issue on uh, the competition between California and Texas or other media outlets that sort of did journalism level um, analyses of this competition. And there were some advocacy books sort of advocating either the Texas model or the California model. And so there was sort of a literature building up, but there had not yet been written anything that was really a balanced, in-depth academic um, analysis of the competition between the two states. I got my um, juices flowing, I guess, from an academic standpoint. And a couple of other things happened that made it um, a really great opportunity for me to do this book. One was I had a sabbatical coming up. This is one of the great things for faculty members at a place like CMC is that from time to time, we get to take a break from teaching and actually leave campus and go pursue some um, particular academic interests that we're wanting to really um, you know, become expert in and dive into and then write a book or a series of articles about. And so in 2017, 18, I had a sabbatical coming up. And an another sort of um, factor that uh, came in is that uh, about a decade ago, I married a, a young woman who is a native of Texas, of Dallas, actually, and her family, most of her family still lives there. And so she was interested in spending our sabbatical year together um, uh, back in Texas, in Dallas. And um, I got an opportunity to do a visiting scholar thing at Southern Methodist University in Dallas. And so this whole year opened up for me to immerse myself in all things Texas, in the history, the culture, the politics, the economics of the state. And this was a state that I knew very little about. I'd sort of focused all of my academic uh, attention on California for the most part. And um, I'd grown up in the state and have lived most of my life here. So I knew a lot about California, but I didn't know um, anything really about Texas. And so I really took that opportunity to um, immerse myself in Texas and try to learn as much as I could about the state so I could make a meaningful, balanced comparison between uh, these two states. Um, and so I was really grateful for that opportunity. Uh, one more thing about how I wrote the book. So it took about three years. Uh, the first year was the sabbatical year where I was sort of um, absorbing information in Texas. And then 2018 and 19 were years that I um, really got serious about writing. And at that point, um, I leaned pretty heavily on a few uh, CMC students. And um, I want to give shout outs to uh, uh, the ones who did sort of most of the significant work. One was Wesley Whitaker, another Sophia Helland, uh, Shabani Panja, and Bruno Yoon, um, our current alumni. They've graduated from CMC. And then a couple of uh, students who are still here, Ben McAnally and Maya Ghosh, um, uh, all contributed in really significant ways to this book. And I think I saw Wesley in the in the chat there. So I'm glad, glad that you're on this call as well. And there may be others as well um, who helped out with the book. So I'm really grateful for the CMC model, um, especially through the connection with the Rose Institute, there was funding for it and support for me to um, work with students um, on various aspects of the book on the research side. And also, um, especially that the book has 40 some maps and graphs. And um, that's a, a skill that I just don't have myself, but uh, our students do. And so I was able to work with them on creating some really high quality graphics uh, for the book as well. And the book was published uh, in August of last year. Um, briefly, the major themes of the book, um, the part, part one of the book is, tries to explore how and why these two states have polarized in the way they have. And the argument is that um, the nature of this polarization didn't really come into being um, until about 20 years ago. And uh, these states have long histories and they actually have overlapping um, uh, 
uh, politics. And, and uh, in many presidential elections in the 20th century, Texas and California were on the same side. Um, many times they voted for Democrats like uh, Franklin Roosevelt or Lyndon Johnson. Other times they voted for Republicans like Dwight Eisenhower or Ronald Reagan. And so they weren't um, you know, on the opposite poles of American politics for much of their history. Uh, and so one of the questions was, how did this happen that they have become um, so polarized? The second section of the book uh, looks at how these two states over the last couple of decades have created rival policy models. So California has very intentionally developed um, a comprehensive set of progressive policies, which uh, it wants for itself and it also wants to become models for other states or even the world, especially on things like environmental policy and climate policy and such. Um, on the other hand, Texas very intentionally sees itself as pursuing conservative policies on taxes and regulation and energy and, and other things. And so uh, this section of the book takes five different policy areas, um, tax, labor, energy and the environment, um, uh, poverty issues like health and welfare, and then social issues um, and creates, uh, first of all, sort of looks nationally at the range of policy options at the state level and then shows how California and Texas have staked out uh, opposing positions on all of these policies. Um, and then the third section of the book describes, uh, sort of has some reflections on what the future might hold for these two states. So um, I, I thought just in a, a brief few minutes during our time here, I'd uh, highlight some of the um, uh, takeaway points for me, at least from these, uh, these three parts of the book. Um, in terms of the polarization of the uh, two states and how that happened. Again, I thought this was a, an amazing puzzle in part because the two states um, are in many ways what I started calling siblings. They both came out of uh, what had been Northern Mexico, uh, sort of in the, the period surrounding the Mexican war of the mid 19th century. Um, and uh, Texas had gotten its independence first, but that was not, and then um, had been annexed and made a state in 1845, which is a precipitating event really for the Mexican-American War. Uh, but its status was not fully solidified until after that war. And California um, became a state in the immediate aftermath of the Mexican War after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo shifted sovereignty over the Southwest uh, from Mexico to California. And they became states within five years of each other, um, Texas in 1845, California in 1850. Um, they had both been, um, targets of the project of westward expansion um, beginning around 1820 or so through the mid uh, 19th century. And in the, the entire, their entire histories um, after that became magnets for uh, domestic migration from other parts of the country into those, uh, into those two states. And so there are high growth sort of sunbelt states um, with uh, increasingly diverse populations. The other thing factor that um, was really fascinating to me was that the, the, a common explanation for why states these days become either red or blue um, boils down to demography. And the statement is often made, demography is destiny. And so as a state's demography changes um, and becomes, for example, more uh, uh, populated by minority folks, so um, Hispanic, African-American, Asian-American, it's more likely to become democratic. And that, that story sort of works in California as the state of California became a majority minority state, it became more solidly democratic. But the story doesn't work in Texas. Um, if, you, uh, if you look at the, the demographics of Texas from pure sort of census cat, uh, level categories, uh, it looks a lot like California. It's a ma majority minority state. Um, the Hispanic population is almost identical in California and Texas at just under 40% by the latest census figures. 39.6% um, in Texas, 39.3% in California in 2019. And those, those percentages have been very consistent, um, similar and rising over time. California has a uh, larger Asian American population, but Texas has a larger African American population. And so if you're, and, and this is why a lot of people, when they talk about Texas and think about Texas, they say, well, it's just on the verge of becoming blue, right? Because uh, once the politics ca catches up with the demographics, then Texas will become a blue state. Um, but 
as I dug into it, I, it just seemed to me that that's not uh, the full story, that there's something different going on. Texas is already very diverse and it's not yet democratic and it may not become democratic, right? Uh, so I wanted to look at other factors that were influencing uh, the uh, movement of California to the left and Texas to the right. Uh, the factors I looked at were origins, um, which I talked a little about already, economics, culture, and finally, the nature of our um, partisan polarization naturally, uh, nationally. So with respect to origins, they were these two states were siblings. They had um, many common experiences as being provinces of Northern Mexico um, entering into the United States at the same time. But the critical difference in their origins was that Texas was originally a Southern state. It was populated by Americans almost exclusively from the American South and it joined with uh, the Confederacy in the Civil War. And so it went through this, the process of uh, secession, uh, the Confederacy, and then Reconstruction after the Civil War. And so it was linked politically, socially, culturally with the South in a very um, uh, serious way. Uh, California, by contrast, was populated by people from all over the United States and internationally. And at the time of the Civil War, it aligned with the North and after the Civil War didn't have reconstruction. Instead, it was able to um, develop economically and industrialize much more quickly. It was linked to the North by the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, and so its whole political development and, and cultural and economic development was oriented toward the North. And as our politics have, over the long arc of history, developed um, a, a core sort of di dividing point between our our two political parties now is the political culture, which is either culturally conservative, which is more oriented toward the Southern United States or more culturally progressive, which is more oriented toward the Northeast, Upper Midwest and the parts of uh, the United States that more uh, influentially developed California. So origins is part of my narrative is a really important in sort of setting the trajectory of these two states. Um, the second is economics, uh, California, as I mentioned, developed economically more quickly, industrialized more quickly. Uh, it unionized. Um, there was division between Northern and Southern California with the North being more unionized, but eventually Southern California unionized as well. Um, and in many ways, the economic model of California over time oriented more uh, closely with the Democratic Party, especially um, as uh, the knowledge economy has emerged in California as the dominant factor in our um, economic development. Uh, Silicon Valley and other sort of uh, tech sector and knowledge sector uh, parts of the economy have oriented toward the Democratic Party in interesting ways. By contrast, Texas has been dependent on um, historically and even to some extent today on resource uh, development, oil and gas, um, principally, um, both extraction and refining, but also more broadly on maintaining um, a low cost uh, uh, opportunities for businesses and individuals to uh, buy and invest low cost land, labor, uh, taxes, regulation. It's a low tax state. And so it attracts people and businesses um, based on a, a low cost model. And uh, that more closely aligns with the contemporary Republican Party than it does with the Democratic Party. Uh, so uh, origins contributed to uh, the direction of these two states, economics did. And then to my mind, culture uh, interpreted broadly is probably the most important factor um, dividing the two states. Uh, starting with Texas, again, it was settled almost exclusively by Southerners in the 19th century, and it retained and still retains its uh, many ties to Southern culture, um, both in terms of religion and um, sort of social structures and uh, many other factors. Um, and in terms of political culture, uh, it is, is there are sociologists and others who have uh, described Texas's culture as being a mix of traditionalistic culture, which is more sort of Southern and a more individualistic culture, which um, embodies the, the Western uh, element of Texas. So Texas is kind of like this interesting fusion between uh, the South, the West, and also um, through immigration, uh, Mexico as well. And it's becoming increasingly diverse, but the, the root 
of the political culture of the state remains sort of um, connected with the South um, and traditionalism as well as kind of this individualistic libertarian element as well. By contrast, California absorbed political culture from um, all over the United States. And, um, but the dominant political culture was really a, a progressive uh, culture. Um, the sociologist, political scientist, I uh, quoted uh, Daniel Elazar in his typology. So this was a moralistic political culture that's, that believes in the importance of government in um, contributing to the public good and increasing uh, individual participation in government. And so that, that roots of political culture in California has um, persisted over time. And as the two political parties have um, sorted the way they have, it has made California more oriented toward the Democratic Party. Okay, so I could talk about um, more about the polarization and how it occurred if uh, there's interest in Q&A. Um, I just wanna say a couple of words about uh, the implications for public policy and how these two states have competed at the national level. So um, both states over the last two decades have created what I call models of, uh, of policymaking. And this is um, not necessarily new. The, the, the concept of states, sort of in individual states uh, doing policy experiments goes back to Justice Brandeis um, and his description of, of laboratories of democracy um, and, and the, back in the early 20th century. And this is a longstanding feature of federalism that individual states can do some experimentation with respect to public policy. What's different now, it seems to me, is that um, as states become increasingly um, oriented toward one pole of the uh, political and policy spectrum, uh, they're they're more inter they're more able to because there's not the kind of internal um, partisan checks that you would have in a competitive two party state. Uh, they're able to and they're motivated to sort of do um, more aggressive experimentation and development of policy models at the state level. And so we've seen that in a lot of states, but most principally in California and Texas, as I mentioned at at the beginning of the of the short talk here. Um, the other thing that's remarkable to me, and, and we could talk about how this has played out in particular policy areas, but what's uh, very interesting to me is can the federal system sort of contain uh, widely different uh, state level uh, policy choices, uh, especially in areas where they seem to be incompatible. So for example, California is, um, uh, very focused on reducing carbon emissions, right? But if California reduces its own carbon emissions for its 40 million people, uh, that's not gonna make any sort of dent on the global uh, you know, climate situation. It really needs the whole United States and ultimately the world to, to follow this trend in order for uh, its objectives in terms of climate policy to, I'm sorry, uh, and its objectives in terms of cl uh, climate policy uh, to uh, be effectuated. And uh, taken to its full extent, this could be uh, uh, threatening to um, the a core industry in Texas, which is the oil and gas industry. And there are many ways in which, and so this is why you see this competition when one administration is promoting sort of progressive environmental policy as the Obama administration did. and now the Biden administration um, is starting to do, for Texas to lead uh, a state level resistance to those policies. And conversely, uh, if the federal government is uh, pursuing policies that are uh, contrary to California's uh, interests then California uh, is motivated through federal litigation to try to challenge those federal uh, level policies as well. And so, um, I guess uh, in conclusion, what I would say is that um, one of my takeaways is um, this competition between Texas and California, first of all, I think it's gonna persist. Uh, one of the questions that publishers had for me as I was developing this book in 2017 and 18 is, well, what happens if Texas flips <laughs> in, uh, in 2020, you've got this new book out and it's got on the cover of the book you know, a blue California and a red Texas and California and Texas becomes blue, which was a live possibility in, um, 
And my, my answer was, I didn't think it was going to happen right away. Um, it may happen at some point in the future, but my, um, my prediction is to the extent that I'm going to make a prediction is that it, it's not going to happen immediately, that there's enough economic, cultural, um, uh, structural reasons why Texas is going to remain um, Republican, at least for a while. And we could have some discussion and debate about that. Um, and California is absolutely going to remain uh, uh, blue, even if Gavin Newsom gets recalled, which I think is unlikely to happen, right? Um, and so there's going to be, uh, this competition is going to persist over time. The state level sort of blocks um, is, and this propensity of states to challenge uh, federal policy through litigation, I think will uh, persist for some time. And so is, is this um, a, a sustainable model for a country really to have this level of, of conflict between at the state level? Um, and uh, will it eventually sort of uh, disintegrate into a, a deeper level of conflict? I don't think to the level of civil war, but to a, a deeper national dysfunction uh, uh, as the states become increasingly um, uh, hostile toward each other? Or is it possible for the nation to sort of um, leverage this dynamic tension between Texas and California, between the progressive model and the, and the more conservative model in productive ways? The competition can play out in such a way that states will sort of make choices um, observing the, uh, the um, application of these two models in these two states and draw lessons from them in ways that um, uh, can be beneficial. And my hope is for the latter. Uh, that's sort of how the book concludes that um, I, um, I do it, admire many things about both of these states. And I think that the, the nation can benefit from learning from the best practices and some of the positive lessons of both. Um, and we can, again, maybe talk about what that might look like. But um, I want to uh, reserve the rest of the time for, for Q&A. And again, I want to thank Evan and uh, the Office of Alumni and Parent Relations and our engagement, and also all of you for uh, being here today. Professor Miller, thank you so much for your, for your comments. Thank you for sharing uh, your book and your experiences with us. We have a lot of questions in the chat. Um, let's start uh, actually with um, what's happened since your book came out and whether, especially in Texas, uh, and then I guess with the recall as well, what would you put in your book uh, now knowing what's happened over the last seven months? Yeah, that's great. So I would, I would of course, update um, after the 2020 election. So uh, there was a lot of, uh, the, the book sort of ends after in 2019 or so. And there was a lot of speculation after 2018 with Beto O'Rourke coming very close to beating Ted Cruz, that maybe the, we, Texas was right on the cusp of turning blue. Um, and actually there was, um, uh, the Republicans sort of regrouped and did better in 2020 than they had in 2018. So that would be just an update. Uh, the, the other issue, of course, that would be fodder for uh, a policy discussion is the um, electricity grid uh, in, in Texas, which had this massive failure uh, recently. And um, one can look at, I mean, initially some leaders in Texas were saying, well, this is actually the fault of moving toward uh, renewable energy, which Texas has done in a meaningful way. So Texas is, many people don't know this, it's a, it's, it is the national leader in wind power and it's a rising uh, uh, contender in solar power as well. So Texas, um, has pursued an all energy strategy, oil and gas, nuclear, coal, and renewables. And um, it was it was kind of strange for me to see that the initial blame was placed on um, the increasing reliance on renewable um, when actually it turned out that basically all the systems were um, unprepared for uh, the, the cold weather that hit Texas, um, not just um, the wind turbines, but also the natural gas and such. So. That goes back to um, one of the themes of the book, which is Texas is light on regulation, on government regulation of industry. And so this raises the question, is it um, under-regulating in some ways? Um, should critical industries like utilities uh, be regulated sufficiently so that you can avoid the, these kinds of system failures that occurred in Texas? And also there's a question of whether Texas should be more connected to the national grid 
it, it basically has walled itself off from the national grid. And so it, it wasn't as able to sort of pull in um, electricity resources as I understand it, um, as, um, as other states might have been able to do in that circumstance. And I just wanna want to say, I, I saw a couple of names on, on the, the Zoom here. Um, I saw uh, Tom Leppard and, and Candace Valenzuela who know a, a lot more about Texas politics and policy than I do. And so you can feel free to correct me if I'm getting any of this wrong, but that, that would be certainly a topic I haven't dug down really deeply into what happened with uh, the grid failure, but I would, I would want to address that issue of regulation um, and whether Texas is under-regulating in some areas. And how do you think that uh, energy issue will impact uh, Texas Republicans, whether in the governor's office or other offices? Yeah, so I, I think um, this is one of those things where you, you don't necessarily know whether um, an event like this will have legs that will continue on. I think for um, uh, for Governor Abbott, um, he's facing re-election in 2022. He's probably glad that this happened, uh, you know, two years out from the election as opposed to on election eve. It probably would have been more uh, difficult for him to sort of recover from uh, that episode if it had, if he didn't have as long as he does between now and re-election. Um, my sense is that it's not going to have uh, big long-term implications for the Republican Party in Texas, that the people sort of have their priors, right? This is part of our, our polarization as a, as a uh, nation overall, is that we, uh, we sort of assign blame or credit uh, based on our pre-existing um, uh, you know, orientation. And so I think people who are generally in favor of uh, Republican energy policies will not, you know, jump uh, necessarily as a result of this incident. But I, again, I'd be interested in hearing from others on, on this. Uh, a lot of people have mentioned they know uh, young conservative families, they know friends, uh, or they themselves are considering leaving California. And that could be to Idaho, Nevada, Texas, Florida, Tennessee, um, what do you think about this mass exodus? Is it as big as we think it is? Is it not really as big? Is, is California still uh, still an importer of, of individuals? Um, and how is that that California, Texas uh, import export divide either growing or shrinking? Yeah, it's, it's a great topic. There's a there's actually a working group at the University of California uh, that's that's uh, drilling down on this issue to try to understand uh, what's going on with population flows and not, not just people, but also businesses uh, uh, in and out of California, because there's a narrative that's, that's growing. Um, when someone like Elon Musk says, I'm leaving California, I'm moving to Texas. Uh, recently, he was the wealthiest man in the world on paper, at least. And Tesla's a big deal, right? And, and SpaceX. And so he's, he's a major figure. And so it became part of a narrative a narrative that included Hewlett Packard, you know, a pillar of Silicon Valley, moving from Silicon Valley to Houston and, and other businesses over time. So there's, there's both sort of the population flow and the business flow. On the population side, California um, was projected to be at about 50 million people by now, um, maybe 15 years ago. So if you sort of follow the, the trend lines and population growth in California, um, by this period, the estimates by demographers was that California would hit about 50 million. We've plateaued at just under 40 million. Um, there hasn't been a net reduction in population um, yet, but in terms of comparison with other states, relative to other states, our population is, um, is stagnant. And so California will lose at least one congressional seat um, as a result for the first time in its history. Um, this is also, um, I guess, in the big picture, this is new to California. Uh, California, from its origins, has been a population growth state. Um, and that there was domestic migration from other states into California, um, much more so than migration from California elsewhere. That's, again, changing in the 21st century. Uh, specifically on your question, there is a net out-migration domestically. So more Americans from other states are... are or I'll put it the other way, fewer Americans are moving from other states into California that are moving from California elsewhere. Um, in terms of total net migration population because of foreign migration 
<clears throat> into California, which is still net positive, were about flat <clears throat> in terms of people coming and leaving the state. But again, that's a big change from where it used to be. Um, one of the questions is what about high income people? Um, because California is highly dependent on high income earners for its revenue stream. And the studies show that um, we are losing some millionaires, but we're also gaining others, both we're creating new ones in Silicon Valley and elsewhere. And we're also, we're also attracting some from other places. So, um, you know, a little vignette I might put into the book might be like Prince Harry, <laughs> right? He could have moved anywhere in the world when he, when he left uh, Buckingham Palace. And where did he move? He moved to Montecito uh, in Santa Barbara. And so that's a high wealth individual who's moving into California. He'll start paying California income taxes, presumably. He and his wife, um, Megan Markle. And there's, there's a lot of that. California, as you can see in that screenshot <clears throat> behind you there, is like a fabulous place to be. That's a beautiful backdrop, the CMC campus. And you know, high income people, if they can pay the premium to be here, will often choose to live in California. Either they'll stay here, they won't do the Elon Musk, they'll choose to stay here, or they'll even if they, are, um, they'll, they'll move here uh, because of the beauty and the amenities of this state. You'd mentioned a few minutes ago about the minority populations in Texas and California being about the same percentage wise. Someone in the chat asked, uh, do they reflect similar numbers in terms of voter registration and those at the polls as well? Um, great question. And so um, <clears throat> I, I know most about, or I look most closely at uh, Hispanic Latino as opposed to the other um, minority groups in the two states. Um, the, a couple of things on that. One is that the voting patterns are somewhat different, that uh, Hispanics in Texas tend to vote somewhat more Republican than they do in California. And I have some reasons, some explanations for that, but they also vote at lower rates. Um, Texas in general has lower voter participation than California. And there's um, a number of different explanations that I have for that. One is in terms of mobilization, that California um, uh, relies in part on organized labor to mobilize uh, low-income and minority voters. Uh, and so, and they incorporate a lot of voters into the Democratic Party who vote democratically. That's part of how California shifted more strongly to the Democratic Party is the work of labor unions, organized labor to mobilize voters. Uh, Texas has much weaker organized labor and unions, um, partly by virtue of public policy. Um, also in terms of just voting registration, and um, participation rules, it's, it's, um, they're, they're stricter in Texas than in California. California goes out of its way to make it as easy as possible to vote and Texas doesn't. And so there are a few reasons why voter participation is lower, I think among all groups, but especially among um, uh, minority and immigrant groups in, in Texas than in California. A question come in about uh, public education systems in California and in Texas. Did you in any way compare the two uh, during in your book uh, and how those public education systems influence culture and politics within those states? Yeah, so this was a big question. I had to decide the scope of the policy chapters and I picked five and I didn't pick education. Um, partly because education, I mean, one would think, well, this is a book about state policies. There's nothing bigger at the state level than education in terms of the dollars spent and the, the importance of the work. And so it was, it was hard to let it go. But education is also, it's a pretty complex area. And there's some cross-cutting um, <clears throat> uh, factors going on. I guess what I did include in the book was some discussion of unionization of uh, teachers. Um, so in California, um, Public, uh, public school teachers got the right to collectively bargain back in the 1970s when Jerry Brown was governor the first time around, as well as other uh, public sector workers got the right to uh, uh, collective bar collectively bargain and to strike. And that's not the case in Texas. Texas teachers are forbidden from striking and they do not have the, the ability to collectively bargain. And so teachers unions have like, they have um, more influence on how the public education system works in California than in Texas. Um, uh, that probably is reflected in the much higher teacher salaries in, in California than in Texas. 
although that's true for you know a lot of sectors that um, California workers are compensated at higher levels, but they're also um, there are higher costs in this state. So it's it's kind of by necessity in a way. Uh, in terms of um, uh, the sort of the curriculum and such, there's lots of interesting things that I didn't get into. That Texas curriculum tends to be much more uh, socially, culturally, politically conservative than California curriculum. And uh, California school curriculum is very intentionally much more progressive. And so that does affect um, public schools and such. And maybe circling back to your earlier question about some conservative people uh, choosing to leave California, part of it is economic, but for some people it's cultural, that they just feel if they're conservative, they feel more culturally, socially comfortable in more conservative places as California has become more progressive. John Sprouse um, asks that uh, uh, you mentioned that Texas attracts businesses and individuals as a low cost, low tax state. What do you think is the conscious policy of each state as to the demographics they desire to attract? Hmm. <laughs> um, that's a super question. I, I've been thinking about that with respect to California um, because it, it um, an argument that I, what, in, in this working group that I was talking about, some people are saying, well, we shouldn't really be concerned about uh, population flows because we continue to re, um, import essentially highly educated um, uh, people from other places. Um, so if you have a college degree or graduate degree and you can get a job in the high tech sector or, or in a corporate law firm or something, you might be, come to California, right? And we continue att to attract people like that. But we're not attracting anybody sort of in the middle class to come to California. Nobody relocates from say Texas to California unless they have the prospect of a, a pretty high income job. Uh, and a lot of people are leaving. And so partly as a result of public policy, market forces and otherwise, California's middle class is essentially hollowing out that we have um, a, a robust sort of high income sector, especially in the coastal areas. And we continue to have a, basically a service sector of low income people who um, continue to live here, partly because they can receive social services, but also for other reasons, um, family ties or whatever, um, remain in California. Uh, Texas, I think is intentionally oriented toward trying to appeal to middle income people. Um, that they will, uh, Texas policymakers will say, it's affordable to own a home in this state, whereas you cannot purchase a home at California prices, right? But you can find a three or four bedroom home, raise a family in Texas. And so I think as a matter of public policy and the culture, uh, Texas is more oriented toward uh, <clears throat> attracting um, middle income, middle class working people than California is. <laughs> Laura Romero, hi Laura, uh, asks, uh, it says, the last few years, judges being elected in Texas have been more liberal. What impact will that have on business and political environments? Yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's a terrific question. I didn't really uh, dive into um, the court system in Texas. You know, one has to make choices. And it's kind of interesting because I've written about uh, two major themes before this book. One was uh, the initiative process, and the other is about courts. And I chose not to focus on either of those topics much in this book because I wanted to do some other things. Um, the courts system in Texas, as I understand it, has sort of gone through uh, an evolution um, back before Republicans uh, sort of gained overall dominance of the state. Um, Texas was known as being um, more friendly to plaintiffs, Texas courts were, um, and there were uh, reforms in the legislature and sort of a recomposition of the judiciary that made Texas more sort of um, defendant friendly in those kinds of uh, lawsuits. And so I, I haven't really tracked the new developments in terms of uh, more liberal judges, but one can expect there might be some course correction on some of those issues um, as well. And there might be other uh, implications also. Jeremy Simkinson, um mentions that he's heard that Texas actually has a higher income tax bracket for individuals making less than $400,000. So first, is that true? And then second, maybe comment on similarities and differences between income tax across the two states. Yeah, so um, 
I would say no, that's not true. <laughs> From my understanding, uh, and this hasn't changed, Texas has a zero income tax for everybody, personal income tax. Now, it might be that total tax payments, um, if you aggregate them in particular ways, um, can be seen as regressive in Texas, which is to say Texas relies uh, heavily on uh, the sales tax and on property tax. The sales tax is considered the most regressive tax. Property tax is sort of in the middle. Income tax is con considered the most progressive, typically, especially if, if a state has graduated um, uh, tax rates. So um, California has moved much more in the direction of relying heavily on the personal income tax and corporate in income tax to the point where the top 1% in California pays uh, essentially half of the state revenues uh, based on the, the personal income tax. California has the highest marginal tax rate for high income people, 13.3%. Um, um, and Texas has, again, zero income tax at all income levels. So that's a big, it's a big difference. And if you think about an, a, a national system where people can move freely across state borders, it does create sort of a magnet to states like Texas or Florida that have no, or Nevada, that have no personal income tax compared to states like New York or California or Illinois, well, especially New York or California that have higher personal income taxes. Um, so that's a few things that could be said. I, I did do it, I chose to do a chapter on taxes because I thought there was a really interesting and stark and ideologically tinged difference between the two states on that issue. Thank you. Um, Steve Eggert posted a follow-up uh, that the judges we were discussing are those that are politically elected and run our counties as administrators, not those that are judicial appointees. So that makes that makes sense. Um, let's talk big tech. Uh, we had both um, Jonathan Medina and Justin Sohai kind of going back and forth about the tech sectors, Silicon Valley versus Austin in particular, and actually commenting that perhaps the two states are more similar when it comes to big tech uh, than different. What, what, what have you seen about big tech between the two states? Yeah, so there's there's certainly a lot of tech uh, movement into Texas and especially Austin. And so Apple, Google, they've located a lot of workers into that state. And it's also a, it's a, an interesting side note. It's given those companies some leverage on public policy in the state. I, I, tell the story in the book of a vignette <clears throat> where um, Texas was considering a bathroom bill similar to the one North Carolina passed. And uh, the LGBT rights community was absolutely opposed to that. The state Senate in Texas um, passed the bill. It went to the state assembly and the then speaker of the assembly, Joe Strauss, who's a moderate Republican, um, I interviewed him for the book. He said, basically, this was the one time that Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, ever called me to lobby an issue. And he said, if you, Texas, are passing these kind of bills, we're gonna stop expanding our workforce in Texas. And the Texas House of Representatives held out, the bill was killed. And it shows that tech can have larger sort of social presence in Texas and other places. Um, in terms of just as businesses, <clears throat> tech is growing, <clears throat> excuse me, tech is growing in Texas, but the VC, the venture capital, the startups, sort of the engine of tech, it seems to me, is still in California. That's where the real sort of um, uh, birth and early growth um, energy is still in tech from my perspective. I'd be happy to hear from Jacinth if she is seeing uh, things differently or others on that. Um, there's room, there's opportunities to grow tech in Texas and Miami and some other places, but um, especially venture capital and formation of new companies, it, it does seem like um, California is still the place to be. Um, Imad Elias asks, to what extent is polarization driven by the machinations of the two political parties rather than being a culmination of origins, economics, and culture? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I, I started by saying that origins, economics, and culture were all contributing to uh, the states becoming more progressive or more uh, conservative, but that didn't necessarily align with political parties. It used to be that Texas was a conservative state, but a deeply democratic state, almost 
universally democratic. And California, although it was a on balance progressive state, was a majority Republican state. So what's happened is that the parties nationally have sorted out so that if you, the Republicans have intentionally identified as the conservative party and Democrats as the progressive party. And so that has caused these states uh, to, and people in these states to choose sides essentially. So um, that's part of a larger realignment. We lost Evan, there he's back, okay. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. Sorry. Um, so we had a couple of people talk about uh, why would wealthy people stay in California or move to California? Uh, besides that, of course, it's beautiful. You have the beaches. There's a lot of, of, of great things about California where a lot of us are here. Um, why would a wealthy person stay in California? Let's say if they could find beauty elsewhere or at least change their their main home. Yeah. So what, what drives people or <clears throat> draws people to California? I think number one is uh, climate and natural attraction is it's for all of California history. That's drawn people here. You think of like Pasadena, the wealthy people from the Midwest who came out and established winter homes and then decided to stay here throughout the state. That's always been part of the attraction, but also the culture. A lot of people are attracted to the progressive political culture, the openness, the spirit of, um, renewal and innovation uh, that exists here. Uh, a lot of people are attracted to that. And if you're um, a creative person um, in the arts and in music, in, uh, in industry, um, you're gonna be drawn to the entertainment industry in Hollywood or Silicon Valley in tech, because that's where most of the energy in these sectors are. And a lot of wealthy people, because they can afford the premium of being here, are willing to pay the price in order to be both in the beautiful um, environment and also in the cultural and economic um, place, uh, amazing place that California is. Talk to us about the middle class. It seems based on your comments that the middle class in Texas is alive and well, uh, but of course in California, it seems to be struggling. Ellen asked if you have any thoughts about how to stem for the loss of or restore the middle class in California and perhaps save us from losing an important part of our population. Yeah, I, I don't have simple answers for that. Um, I think it's probably the most important um, issue facing the state over the next generation and more is how do you um, prevent California from becoming a totally bifurcated society of, of really wealthy people and then poor people. Um, the state's answer, public policy is to try to lift the, the lower end through government programs and subsidies um, I don't ultimately think that's successful. I think trying to find ways to uh, encourage and support um, small business development and um, uh, through reducing regulations in some ways um, and also um, affordable housing. That's one of the, the biggest barriers for middle-class folks living in California is uh, the cost of housing. So if there could be ways to change policies in order to build more houses that people can afford, that would be helpful. So final question, uh, and then we'll conclude. Uh, for the Republicans in California and the Democrats in Texas, what hope do they have that in, 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 at some point their states will in fact switch, um, or perhaps that their, their ideas and their policies will be a little bit more accepted? Yeah, well, I think for Democrats in Texas, even if they can't flip the state, they're, they're major players in um, state politics. I think the Republican Party in the state after 2018 recognized that it basically has to moderate in many ways or it's going to um, risk losing control of the legislature and the congressional delegation and such. So uh, Democrats are a very large and present minority in, um, in Texas and are part of the conversation, especially in urban areas where Democrats control most of the major cities in the state. So that's a major sort of um, place where Democrats have influence is at the um, municipal level. In California, Republicans have a lesser role. I think their, their role is essentially to be sort of like the prophet in the wilderness, basically saying, um, <clears throat> you know, this, this seems excessive to us, you know, this is too much. Um, occasionally on, because of the presence of direct democracy, uh, conservative issues can get a hearing before the public and Republicans can sort of play on some ballot measure issues. 
but in terms of electoral politics for the foreseeable future, and this recall is one of those sort of incidents of that. But in general, uh, Republicans, until they sort of figure out how they can operate in a state that's much more progressive than national Republican Party, we're going to have a hard time in California. All right, Professor Miller, thank you very much. Of course, we did not get to all of the questions, so I do apologize. Uh, but of course, you're welcome to reach out to any of us, and we're happy to connect you with Professor Miller at any time. I'm sure he'd be happy to hear from all of you as well. Again, we will post this and other recordings on our virtual library on the alumni and parents section of the cmc.edu website. We hope you join us on Thursday where we're talking to two alumni, Justin Levitt 06 and Douglas Johnson 92, talk about redistricting and gerrymandering and what everything will look like post census. Professor Miller, thank you so much. Everyone feel free to unmute, say hello, say goodbye. We hope to see you next time.